Well, there's some uh, good economic news uh, today. You know, we the economic indicators are up. Uh, the auto companies are calling workers. Uh, housing shows signs of recovery. Uh, are you prepared to say that the recession is over and uh, uh, recovery is here? Well, let me quote Mr. Volker in his speech <coughs> last night. I saw a bit of it on television where he says the foundation for a solid, lasting economic recovery has been laid. And I have been saying that for some time because I think that's what our, well, I know that's what our goal was that we were trying to accomplish. But I do think that uh, we can't deny the signs any longer. The fact that the weekly sign-ups for unemployment insurance, which uh, not too many weeks ago were running in excess of 600,000, like 670,000 a week and so forth, Although I must say, no one, when they used those figures, ever gave the other figure of how many left unemployment insurance every week. Um, and that was usually a considerable figure, but now the latest week that we have is the lowest sign-on since September of 1981. And I, I feel that all of these things are indications that, yes, we have bottomed out. Recovery, I think everyone would agree that recovery is. Why, why do you think it's taken so long? There's a, a public perception that the economic policies haven't, at least so far, been working in the way that you thought and said uh, a few years ago in terms of jobs, investment, economic growth. Well, if I could complain a little bit about that. First of all, we didn't get all the economic program that we asked for. Uh, we, so there was a slower pace in bringing down uh, government spending, excessive spending, even though we, we did bring down the rate of increase, which had been 17% a year, down to 11%, but that's not nearly enough. The, I felt, and the basis of our program was when I announced it in Chicago in 1980 during the campaign, was that the percentage that the people were paying in taxes, the percentage of gross national product, the percentage that the government was spending of gross national product were both too high. Now significantly, the spending percentage was higher than the revenue percentage, which is why consistently over the decades we've had uh, de uh, deficits. But we had counted on getting that tax part of the program retroactively to January 1st, 1981. Well, we didn't get the first installment of the tax until October of 1981, and then it was only half of what we'd asked. So people began talking about the program and whether it was succeeding or not uh, at a time when even only a part of the program had been put into effect. Now, we believe that the tax cut program that we advocated was one that would offer a stimulant to the economy, to savings, to investment, and so forth. But you have to wait till the people get the money. Just signing the bill and saying we've got a tax cut hasn't changed their fortunes yet. That, you have to give time for that money to be accumulated. And if you stop to think of it now, here it is, we've been two years now. And we still have more than a third of, much more than a third, almost half of the tax cut yet to be implemented. It'll be another five months yet before that next 10% installment goes in, and then it'll be another year uh, before the, uh, we get the effect of, of the indexing, which stops the government from profiting on inflation. I think the First of all, the recession was unexpected. I don't know why we call it the recession beginning then. We've been in really a growing recession since 1979. Uh, if you look at the unemployment figures, if you look at the rate of inflation and the interest rates, I think the interest rates, this was part of what contributed to it. They, 
they came down much slower than they had reason to because uh, we brought inflation down faster than we'd anticipated. And that in itself uh, set us back further with regard to revenues because uh, uh, since the government does make a profit on, on uh, recession, I mean on inflation, uh, I've, I've gone back and looked at the at the projections made by all the experts, not just here in Washington, but all of the economists around, and their projection was that inflation for 1982 would be 8%. Well, it was 3.9. But uh, if you if you had the last two years to do over again, uh, knowing that you couldn't uh, make Congress move any faster or do it more your way. Is there anything in retrospect that you would do differently by way of policy, economic policy? No, not really, because I think we were on the right track. Um, it's just taking a little longer. Yes, because it started later than we would have started it and all. Um, maybe I could have fought harder for some of the things, but I, I don't know how. We fought pretty hard. Um, but I think that we are seeing it now. We are seeing the results. But I think that to uh, say a program had failed when it was still in the, uh, in the stage of being implemented, I think now we're seeing the results. And uh, I think the stock market reflects that. Certainly the automobile companies are beginning to call people back. What is happening? Uh, the lower interest rates, which is the key to the whole thing, there is a backed up group of buyers, potential buyers out there. Normally in the United States, uh, the average, people averaged keeping an automobile three and a half years. Well, the average age of the automobiles out on the road today is seven years. Now that means there's a backed up market of people out there that want to buy, but they couldn't buy. We all buy cars at the installment plan and make the payments and the interest rates were too high, and suddenly as these rates come down, you see a proportionate increase in the, in the buying. The uh, administration is forecasting a 1.4% uh, real economic growth uh, next year. Uh, why such a weak Well, that isn't the correct figure to use. That is a comparison uh, between a starting point in 82 and then a starting point here, that it's going to be that much above that point in 82. Actually, and we think we're being very modest in this because, again, the projections are so far apart. There are people, and equally expert, who are projecting a, a much uh, uh, a low pessimistic recovery. There are others that are way up here uh, in a very optimistic thing. We're somewhere in between, and we've chosen to, because uh, the law requires us to project, uh, we've chosen about a 3.1 for the year of 83. But, uh, obviously, it does not start out at 3.1, but it will accumulate and be a 3.1% growth. Now, this will put us on a declining path of deficits if the Congress will meet the program that we have uh, that we proposed, the freeze on overall budget spending. and. Uh, we want in place that contingent temporary tax increase uh, in case the pessimists are right. It can only go into effect if the deficit is 2.5% of gross national product. If the Congress has not given us our freeze and our, our reductions, and if the recession is apparently evolved into a growth pattern, then all of those things being in place, uh, then you would then you would trigger the, the tax program for three years. Uh, Are you optimistic? I mean, do you think that the standby tax won't be needed? Well, everybody accuses me of being the optimist here. I suppose I should stay with the uh, cautious proposal we're making, but I just can't help but have an optimistic feeling that recovery uh, may just be better than we're allowing ourselves to think. Well, are you worried in any sense by the uh, initial resistance that the uh, contingent tax plan has received from some of your Republican 
uh, con congressional leaders on the Hill, the, before you really even had a chance to articulate this proposal in State of the Union, there were some people in advance that were casting doubts on it. Um, do you feel that that really compromises the chances of you ever getting this thing enacted? Well, I'm hopeful that when they see all the details, I think when they, uh, when they first rose up against the contingency, they didn't realize the conditions that I myself would be opposed to it just as a tax plan out there waiting because then I could see those in the Congress who prefer to spend, they'd say they'd feel free not to make any reductions in spending or to even spend more because they're saying, well, we've got this tax that will go into effect. But the fact that one of the contingencies is they must make the reductions that would be a vast for or the tax won't go into effect. And I think that cooled off some of the opposition. Well, is it safe to say that uh, you've proposed this plan, which has been described as uh, an insurance policy on the deficit, uh, primarily because you as an optimist are convinced you will never have to resort to it? I hope I don't, but I can understand the value of it. I think it'll do much psychologically to reassure the money markets out there, because right now the interest rates are higher than they have a right to be based on 3.9% inflation. So you have to say, well, then what is keeping them up there? And as I said the other night, I think fear is keeping them up there, that people are saying, well, we want to make sure, knowing what has happened in the past and the history of those in government who want to go for the quick fixes and so forth, uh, and flood with artificial money, flood the market, end up with go inflation again, so they're protecting themselves. It seems to me that this, on top of the other proposals we're making, is a kind of an assurance to them that no, the deficits are not going to skyrocket and no, we're not going to go back to that. We're going to fight inflation. And uh, this, I think, could, could have a salutary effect on it. What, what would your reaction be if Congress, uh, in the course of considering this proposal, winds up instead modifying the, the July installment of the personal tax cut or tampering with indexation. Is, does that mean a veto in your mind? Yes, it does, because I think those two things are a definite part of the plan. I think, I think part of the optimism of, of the signs that we see right now are because the people have been able to look in business and all, have been able to look ahead and plan, uh, knowing that these things are going to happen. Uh, final tax question. You, you've said recently that um, uh, the idea, the, uh, you believe in the idea that the corporate income tax really should be eliminated at some point. Uh, when and how do you propose to uh, do this? <laughs> the, this, ha this takes some explaining. Uh, no, we haven't, nor had I said to anyone, hey, look at this and study it or anything else. The truth of the matter is, is you perhaps don't know, but I've been out of the mashed potato circuit as a, an after dinner speaker and a luncheon speaker for more than a quarter of a century. And uh, uh, I've often described it that if in Hollywood you didn't sing or dance, you wound up as an after dinner speaker. <laughs> and uh, I started out, I guess, those years ago, uh, speaking about our own industry and uh, tax discrimination and so forth against the picture business because of its. Uh, kind of fat, luxurious image and all in, uh, in publicity. But in speaking more and more, I, and being invited to speak to national conventions and so forth, and national board meetings of the NAM and all that, I realized that uh, that I had to, I couldn't expect every audience to be interested in the problems of the picture business. So I logically enough, tied them to what I saw as government intervention and unnecessary government interference and regulation and tax policies with regard to business. And I would make the tie in of if it can happen to one industry, it can happen to others. And gradually the Hollywood portion of the speech got smaller and smaller and until it was even less than an introductory paragraph. And I talked about the things that I had researched and learned what was going on in other businesses and industries. And I made speeches, and over these 25 years or more, I have spoken about the fact that in taxing policy, this is politically expedient to seemingly 
remove a tax burden from the taxpayer himself and apply it to something unfeeling like a corporation. And I always pointed out that business doesn't pay taxes. Business collects taxes for government and does it very efficiently. But all those taxes eventually wind up back on the, the taxpayer or the, the citizen. And in fact, some of the examples I had, and I would research them, and they were accurate, that you go into the market and buy a dozen eggs. There are a hundred accumulated taxes in that egg, and the chicken didn't put one of them there. <laughs> and uh, so I was pointing out that through this, the government had managed to increase the tax burden without the people being aware of how much tax they were actually paying. And I have spoken in, on my own radio program several before I came here, uh, I did several broadcasts on this same subject and on the corporate tax. And I pointed out that on the corporate tax, a corporation is a thing. You can't tax a thing. But it is owned by people. Now, some of those people are little investors who hope to retire on a on a modest income from earnings of blue chip stocks they own, and they may not even be in an income tax bracket. Or if they are, it's a very low one, an elderly couple out there and their dividends. But in reality, their, being, their earnings are being taxed at 46% before they get them. Now we know that labor unions, those who are in the upper income tax brackets and they're paying 46% and then they're paying again when they get it as yeah. as dividends. So what I've always pointed out is that if the earnings were passed on to the owners, those who owe no tax would get more return than they're getting. But also in addition to that, business itself would be freer to take some of that that they're now passing on and reduce the price of the product, which would make them more competitive, particularly in international competition. Uh, they might take some of it and be able to reward their employees better. But if they wanted to retain some of the profits to reinvest in the business, would that be taxed? This, I think, would ha you'd have to protect that this was legitimate, that there was a legitimate amount that this could be done so that you couldn't have such a thing as the, uh, you know, building up a great capital gains thing and just artificially keeping the money uh, in the company. But that could be covered very easily. Well, but. Excuse me. No, well, I was just going to say, but in this seminar the other day, when we were talking, and I introduced it with a question. I said, because the speaker before me, a businessman, had talked of the penalties uh, of the tax structure and so forth and how they interfered with business. And so, talking then, I said, uh, that's when I said, I'll kick myself for saying this tomorrow, but I said, when are we going to have the courage to really face up to the corporate tax? and the part that it plays. But no, I haven't asked for that. What we had been talking about here, and are still talking about, and not right now because of we're going to try to get this package through, but that we should be, for the future, looking at simplification of the tax code. Yeah, in, in the future, when we get down to tax reform, if we ever, if ever do, do you have any particular preference whether we should shift to a flat rate tax or a consumption tax, or are your, or your mind open on this question? My mind is really open on it. Uh, all I ask is that we find a way that, well, i give my own example. I, I, used to, I used to fill out my own tax forms, and even when I was, receiving some of that make-believe money in Hollywood. And, uh, but I'm unable to do it when uh, my tax forms were sent to me here last year, all filled out, I couldn't understand them. <laughs> and I wonder, you know, does the government have a right to have a tax system so complicated that a person not only has to, even of modest means, has to hire professional advice, and then the government says to them that it is so complicated that if they make a mistake, they will be penalized and have to pay a fine you know, for making a mistake. Mr. President, you said before that the key was interest rates uh, to the recovery, key to the recovery. Are you satisfied that the Fed policy is doing enough to keep interest rates down? Should they do more to make interest rates, interest rates even lower than they are now? Do you think there's room for that? 
I think, I think right now the Fed has been, and for some time, has been very cooperative in this. And that again, with the discount rate and all, the, the tax rate could be lower than it is. And it, the tax, that's going to be determined by the financial houses out there. And as I say, I think that they could do that uh, without uh, any further actions. For a time when the Fed kept the discount rate so high, uh, obviously they couldn't come down. Yeah. But it's down there pretty low now. Well, we're, well, excuse me, but while we're on the subject, before we leave the Fed, I have to ask you this question. Uh, Boca's term comes up in August. Do you, do you reconsider? Or, I haven't even, him, or you I haven't even it? given any thought to, to that. I haven't given any thought to no. it? No. I'll take that to August. To, it's a long way away with all of the things that are on our plate right now. Um, let's talk about unemployment. Even with the new initiative and the state union message, uh, the administration expects that we'll finally stay double digits as well into 1984. Is there nothing else that government, the government can do to bring down the jobless rate faster? Well, the things that I hinted at and the things we're going to do, first of all, we have already one training program in operation that we passed last year. This is a training program that, in contrast to some of the previous government programs, like CETA, where as little as 18 cents out of the dollar went to actual training. This program of ours went 70 cents out of every dollar is going to training. But the other thing is, we're going to put the training out here in the areas and the local communities. In it, will be, we'll take into the management of it, local officials and local business and industrial leaders, and train people in a city for the jobs that are available in that city or that community, that area, so that we're specifically pointing the program. We expect that program to train about a million a year. Now, the other things that we're talking about are seeing if we can, uh, in cooperation with the states where they have and uh, administer unemployment insurance programs, where if we can't make it possible for them to use some of that unemployment insurance money for training, for relocation, and so forth. And we're going to look at more uh, training things that we can do because we think that this recession and the unemployment in it is much more than just a recession, that there's a very definite structural part. In the two years uh, preceding the the big slump that happened in July of 81, when what was called the recession started, although it was a pretty good recession uh, in 1980, with interest rates at 21 and a half and inflation at 12.3, and unemployment at about 7.8, if I remember correctly. Uh, the, we believe that part of that represents a structural thing of a change that is being occurring in our country uh, as a technological change. We know that some of the steel workers we laid off would never go back to those jobs. Not that we won't make steel in America, but we know that there are modern ways of making it and that, um, that our competition are using uh, that uh, will require less manpower. The same is true in the automobile companies. We'll be making automobiles, but the robotizing of, of the plants and all. But we also know that there are industries out there begging for workers. Uh, over the New Year weekend, being in Los Angeles, and I took the Los Angeles Times on Sunday and opened it up to the Help Wanted ads. Now there were 45 and a half pages of Help Wanted ads in that paper. But what struck me was a difference in tone Instead of just that notice, you know, the little strip of uh, vacancy for a person that can do such and such, there were ads, and all in the higher technology field, ads that were literally solicitations. They were selling programs, you know, please come to our plant. We need such and such, and, and they were trying to lure uh, people, that, the technology, everything from computer programmers to uh, engineers and so forth, and this was an indication 
that with all of this unemployment, there is another side of it, of industries that are expanding and growing and can't find the people with the skills. So we think, rather than the CETA type of dead-end job that is supposed to be just waiting out the recession, no, let's train some people. The other day in Boston, that OIC, where those young people, all of them, disadvantaged from disadvantaged homes and so forth, being trained as computer programmers there. They told me that they've just, 29 of them have just completed the course. 12 of them were already hired. Four more were being hired while we were there. And there's another 10 that are being interviewed that they expect to place very shortly. And uh, this, we think that this is a part of, of this problem here. In addition to that, there has been a tremendous change and increase in the potential employee pool. If you take, as we've had taken traditionally for statistics, that everyone over 16 to 65 is potentially a worker, the percentage that are employed right now in this country is greater than the percentage that were employed a few years ago when we had full employment, meaning that there has been an influx. In the two years I started to say a little while ago and didn't finish the sentence, in the years that, uh, two years that preceded the big bump in July, some three million new entrants to the job market were on the scene here in this country. <coughs> and we didn't have the new jobs uh, available. The Democrats are talking about a $5 billion emergency jobs bill, and uh, Senate Republicans are preparing a $2 billion uh, jobs creation package. Can you veto these bills? Well, we're looking at the, at the $2 billion one from this standpoint. I haven't seen it yet, but we understand that it probably, it, that it isn't just the old-fashioned concept of that, that it contains training and some things of, of that kind. We're also thinking more in terms of a change in our own unemployment insurance thing of giving an individual, you might say, a voucher and uh, protect against someone just uh, taking back an employee they've laid off or something, but allowing them to go to an employer in which for those first months, uh, for a period of time, while they will be literally in on-the-job training, the employer uh, would only pay part of their income on the so-called unemployment insurance would pay the other part. But we're looking at this one because it may not be just a jobs program. It may have the facets that we could approve. If the other one is the typical make-work job program, I've already vetoed a couple of one. One of the programs that was introduced earlier, last year, that I vetoed, was a program that would not have actually gone into effect until 1985. Well, if you've got recovery on the way, and you add to the deficit the program of that kind, you could set back recovery, even though you were temporarily helping some people in this regard. Let me ask you a question that people ask me. They sometimes say, What's going on in the White House? We lower echelons or levels, these leaks from people that I guess have no uh, particular religion about what we're trying to do or anything, and they, uh, they feel important if they can give something. But many of these leaks are down at a level where you've asked for uh, options. You've said, uh, hey, tell us everything what would be possible to achieve this or do this? And then they leak. One, of, one example of that was over Thanksgiving, the firestorm that was created about whether I was going to tax unemployment insurance. Now, may I speak disparagingly of your media for a moment? This was all over the media, and I hadn't even seen it. It is true that someplace down the line, in preparing a lot of options and everything that could be looked at, Someone had put this in and then gone out and leaked it. It hadn't even reached us yet. But there was this big firestorm. And yet no one mentioned that unemployment insurance is taxed. That this was passed during the Carter administration. That anyone with an income of $12,000 pays tax on unemployment insurance. What they also didn't mention was that several prominent Democrats in the House and Senate 
as late as last August, had introduced a bill to tax every dollar of unemployment insurance for everybody getting it. And this was never mentioned, and I was hung up there on the wall for, as if I were advocating this. Well, when, when I got a call from our own staff here and said what had happened, I said, look, I'll tell you right now, the answer to that is no, we're not going to do it. But uh, what I said I would talk about for a moment ago, and let me just, as briefly as I can, explain it. I've had an image that cabinet meetings in the past have largely been devoted to, say, like a once a month ceremonial uh, gathering in which each cabinet uh, member would uh, report on how things were going in their particular agency. Well, in California, I changed the cabinet system to one that was more akin to a, a board of directors. And it took me a while because while none of them had ever been cabinet members before or in public life, they, uh, I sought people that I wanted from the private sector, as I did here. And uh, I had to keep hammering at them that they weren't to keep their mouths shut because the issue being discussed only involved one agency. There isn't any such issue. They all cross over into other agencies. If you're talking foreign trade, you know you're involving the State Department of National Defense as well as Congress and so forth. So what we do is that this issue goes out on the table and uh, everybody has their say. And I sit there and am getting all of this, but I know the one difference between a board of directors and the cabinet is they're not going to take a vote. I'll make the decision when I've heard enough to make the decision. And if I haven't, we come back again for another meeting. And so the decisions, when I make one, obviously it's going to be against the views presented by some and in support of others. But there is no, I've never seen any animus about this, never seen any resistance. When I make the decision, that's the decision and everybody gets behind it. And they've all found out that next time around, uh, they may be on the winning side with their views. Well, on the subject of the big decisions, uh, do you feel that you're under any increasing pressure to declare your intentions, perhaps even before you, you'd like to, about 84? Uh, and uh, what is your current thinking about uh, your intention to seek re-election in 84? Well, <laughs> I can't answer that question, really. The uh, no, there are people that are saying I should, and I know there's a time when I'm going to have to uh, to say that one way or the other. Uh, I also know there's a time when I don't think you should. Uh, if you say it too soon, you then are handicapped in that, uh, you, for whatever you may want to do, everyone assails it as being uh, a political gimmick. Uh, if you wait too late, uh, then you might find uh, a lot of stirring around and factionalism as people begin to... Uh, decide whether they should do it. So I'll make it when I think the time is right, but I also think that, as I've said many times, I think the people kind of tell you uh, whether you should or not. On, on a, another area entirely, there is a tremendous amount of disarray in OPEC these days, and I was wondering, do you view the current disarray of the oil cartel as something that is basically a positive development for the U.S. and the Western economies? But I have, to, I have to believe this. I know it's all over oil prices. Uh, and incidentally, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, in spite of the predictions of $2 a gallon gasoline in America when we were talking decontrol, we've had decontrol and it's now less than a dollar in price in many places. Um, I think that long range, anything that lowers the price for the consumer is good. In the short range, I can see where uh, there would be troubles for, and, and for some of the lesser developed countries that are dependent on oil as their export product if this happens. But in the long range, uh, if the consumer's better off and can use more of the product, uh, uh, they will eventually get over that short-term problem too. So, uh, but I, as I say, I know there will be some short-term problems. Matter of fact, some automobile people have told me uh, 
that even give them problems if the price goes down more. Yeah. Because uh, as the prices come down, Americans are returning to their first love, which is big cars. Big cars yeah. And uh, yeah. they figure that they can afford it at the new price of gas. Mr. President, on another foreign policy issue, the Japanese Prime Minister was here recently. Do you feel you received assurances, serious assurances for him that something will be done by Japan to correct the imbalance in U.S.-Japanese trade? I, we have uh, very solid discussions with him, and I think that he is sincere. We're well aware of the, of the political problems that he faces, and we know that he can't wave a wand instantly. He's a little bit like I am. He's got a, a diet there that he has to uh, uh, work with. And, uh, but I believe that he truly thinks we will all be better off if uh, we have freer trade and, uh, of course, that we have, at the same time, uh, uh, rectify some of the things that are yeah. keeping it from being uh, as open as it should be. But he also sincerely feels that uh, we really are the two economic giants in the world and that between us, we kind of have a responsibility to help the world get out of this recession. Right. On a specific issue, Mr. President, the Japanese have long wanted to import Alaskan oil. We need legislation for that. Would you support legislation which would permit Alaskan oil to be exported to Japan? Yes, I would. I think that it makes a lot of sense. For one thing, our Alaskan crude, as you know, the bulk of it, I don't think we still have any refineries on the West Coast that can handle it. So that crude comes all the way down and off the canal and then because the giant tankers can't go through the canal, it is transshipped through to the other side and then goes on up to the Gulf uh, refineries where they can use it. And here would be the short haul for Japan, and we in turn then could get what we need in import, uh, take the, we'd become the market that Japan is for that, that other source. And it, I, it seems to me that there's a benefit there for all of us. Of course, this is a time to also point out that we have, since decontrol, we have reduced our import of oil by half. We've cut it in half because of the increased development right. here. If, if Congress were to pass lo local content legislation uh, limiting auto imports or a bill requiring reciprocity in some way in the trade, would you veto such bills? Well, let me say without getting it, because if you tag yourself as any such thing, a blanket indictment, there may be a program that uh, you think was suitable. In principle, I would veto protectionist legislation, you know, as I say, in broad principle, because uh, protectionism has never worked. <coughs> it becomes a two-way street, and the more open trade is, the better off everyone is, the consumer and, and, every, and the businesses themselves that are involved. And uh, uh, I was not supportive at all. I opposed that content bill they were talking about because I think it would lead to the kind of protectionism that would be harmful to all of us. You said a moment ago that uh, oil imports were way down, even uh, with had to control all. But isn't part of the reason for that the, the recession is just curbing? I'm not sure that recession has as much to do with it, maybe some, but the, uh, first of all, we're seeing the effect of, of the change in the automobile in this country and the, the conservation uh, that this has brought about because of the increased mileage and all. Uh, I think the price alone has had a, an effect uh, that has encouraged conservation. People think twice, uh, depending on their means, as to whether they're going to, is this trip necessary, is the question they ask themselves. But uh, we're seeing, uh, as I say, a change in that as the price has come down. There's no, no question, but price is a factor for everyone, whether there's a recession or not. Uh, uh, back on the trade again for a minute. Do you want expanded legislative authority to move against what you consider unfair trade practices? 
anything that would help us in that. And we have, we've been very quietly moving because I, I believe in quiet diplomacy. I think that once you start uh, front paging everything you're going to do, well then you, you put the people you're dealing with in kind of a political corner where they can't appear to be backing down in the face of demands from uh, outsiders. Uh, so we have been meeting, numerable meetings, and doing very well from the Department of Commerce and our trade our representative ambassador, uh, Brock, and in our relationships with the European countries and the GATT uh, and tariff programs. Uh, Nakasone, great political courage, did a remarkable job in moving back tariffs. There are still other restrictions that uh, are having even worse effect in tariffs that we're going to continue to, to work on. And uh, I, think we, we, I think we've made some sizable progress in that respect, and we're, gonna, we're going to continue uh, working at it. We'll be trying it in our uh, summit meeting here in Williamsburg, Virginia in May. But uh, we're are you optimistic about that meeting? In line of, uh, what happened yes, in Versailles? <laughs> yes, for one reason, because uh, uh, we we've, we've made some changes already since I'm the host. Uh, we have decided against uh, a real formalized agenda, and then a communique at the end that is supposed to spell out what you've accomplished and what you haven't accomplished. Uh, I have made the proposal and it's been very well received by the other countries of why don't we just get together and sit around that table and throw out on the table all the problems that we think need solving and uh, see what we do about it and no communicate. I'd like to ask you kind of a multi-part question on East-West relations. Um, part one is uh, how do you respond to some of the European critics of your policy that say what you're basically doing is, is stalling on arms control until you complete the U.S. military buildup? And if, if you don't accept that, um, what kind of a concrete sign of good faith specifically would you like to see from the Soviets that would, in your mind, make a uh, reagan Andropov summit uh, possible between now and 84? Well, we know that there's a great <clears throat> propaganda campaign going on, Soviet-inspired with regard to the disarmament, to try and uh, separate us from our allies and to make the people in Western Europe think that somehow we're not uh, sincerely bargaining. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Vice President Bush is going to Europe to meet with uh, our allies over there discuss this with them. But from the very first, from the first that I ever suggested the zero option in INF, if you look at my entire statement, I said that we will negotiate uh, with any legitimate and on any legitimate proposal that may be made in those negotiations. Now so far I don't think a legitimate proposal has been made when the Soviet Union, the only proposal they have come up with is one which would leave them with, it's true, less missiles than they presently have, but still enough to target virtually every population center in Europe, and uh, we uh, would be left with zero. Well, that's not exactly a half and half deal, the fact that uh, Half of us have zero and the other half has missiles. But are you surprised by the European sudden resistance to those missiles since my understanding is that we developed those, some of those new missiles at their insistence to put them on their soil for protection. And at their request. Um, aside from the Soviet propaganda campaign, is there any other force at work do you think that suddenly made them have cold feet about this? No, so far we haven't had any falling away as far as the heads of state are concerned. And uh, we, we again are going to make it plain that uh, we've made a proposal that we think is solid, that would leave that whole area free of any of those intermediate range weapons, both sides. Uh, the Soviet wants to make truly a legitimate and a counter proposal. 
it's got to be, it's got to be for a balance, and it's got to be verifiable. And uh, we're willing to discuss anything of that kind. They, they bring it up. We still believe that zero is the best option. We believe this would be the best thing for peace in the world and for all of Europe and for the Soviet Union if they would do it. Um, the, the wave of well, the peace movement, as we've seen here in our own country, uh, we think was, uh, has had some Soviet considerable backing. It's uh, the main organizing group behind it is the World Peace Council, which is uh, a Soviet organization. It's supported by the Soviets and all, and uh, maybe it's just a part of their negotiating. But uh, we'll negotiate. And we're going to make it, I think that uh, we can make it plain. If we present to the people of Europe, there, there hasn't been much of a uh, public relations campaign from our side, but I think when the people of Europe see that one side is suggesting retaining missiles targeted on their homes and their cities, and that at the same time that they demand that Western Europe have no deterrent. Uh, I think that the people will say, well, just a minute, that's, that's not a fair proposal. Mr. President, the other side of the, the side dollar of is of the East-West trade issues, and we seem to be getting some sort of conflict with our European allies. We'd like to tighten up our trade with the Soviet bloc. They don't seem to be as enthusiastic to do so. Will you continue to press this view, even though it might increase this split? No, we think, we think that that agreement that we got, that paper that we finally got, and after which we then lived to the sanctions, it was really what we wanted in the first place. And that was some agreement on, number one, high technology, and number two, not uh, subsidizing a trade with the Soviet Union which would enable them to continue spending more of their resources on their arms buildup. And we've gotten great agreement, including agreement of the, our European allies, to explore with us other sources of energy uh, so that they won't someday be subject to blackmail, be overwhelmingly dependent on the Soviet Union for gas, as long as the Soviet Union controls the valve that shuts it off. And uh, they've agreed to that, and we're going forward with that study. And they agree that they won't sign any further contracts for Soviet gas while this study is going forward. Okay, sir. Well, we thank you very much. We <laughs> have any $64 question left that was going to be the The only one I can think of is that I've now seen two polls that show such luminaries as Glenn and Mondale testing you in 84 trial heat. Uh, are you worried? Well, this is a little bit like uh, uh, you're seeing the odds on a game before the kickoff. Uh, because uh, I was also encouraged when after the State of the Union address, a poll revealed that I rose about 15 points in the poll uh, after the speech when the same questions were asked that were asked by the same people before the speech. If it had been two different polls, I might not have been as impressed, but when uh, the same poll taken after the speech uh, showed 73% of the people believing that they're going to be better off in the coming year, and 59% believe that uh, uh, that we uh, we were on the mend, and uh, and there was a 15% increase in their rating of what I was doing. Uh, so I think a poll is uh, really only worth one. Maybe it means that you're very reassuring. Thank you very much for your time. Good to well, see you. Well, good to see you. Pleasure. Thanks very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And good luck. And good luck. Thank you.